Hi there. Welcome to my Facebook show and today I really have a, a special for you. I have my dear friend Laura Berman who is the author of a book called Quantum Love and we're here to talk about life, death, relationships, love, sex, I mean everything, just everything. <laughs> and I That's welcome right. your questions. So I just want to real quickly say that um, Laura was on about a month ago where mm -hmm. we had her by, um, we had her Skype in. So she was not sitting in my right. home. We had you Skype in and the internet connection wasn't good. And so we couldn't hear you right. properly, but everybody was just loving what you were saying mm -hmm. and we were getting so many questions. And so we had to end the call because the, the, um, because, because of my horrible just, internet yeah. connection that day. And I said to Laura, you have to just come over so we can do this because right. everybody loves you. And so we've been trying to schedule it, but so much has happened. Yes. And I'm going to get into what's happened with you. Right. And how have you been? What's happening with the movie deal? Oh, gosh, the movie deal. Well, uh, I have to admit, at the moment, there is nothing signed. It hasn't oh, really? really worked out with the previous people I am speaking to some people at the moment but oh, at the so moment now it's free game and now it's free game yes so it's like completely right. open to offers and stuff like that well, so we'll have to talk about that more offline because uh, yeah. I know a lot about I've been through the you know I've been around this a lot with the life story right yeah. and the potential and your life story uh, as we all know, is astoundingly beneficial, beneficial to all of us um, and so inspiring. I was sharing with you before we even started, that's the reason, I mean, you were sweet not to jump right into this, but the reason it's been a month before I came over here is because not long after our tech snafu ridden attempt at a Facebook Live, um, my dad passed away. Yeah. And so... The, the past month has been, I mean, he's been ill for a long time, and I've been his person for seven years, his, after, since my mom died. Um, and so I was with him every step of the way, and this last month, you know, as we all know, was an, he had cancer, he had dementia, he had lots of things going on. But what was so powerful, and I wanted to tell you, is that, you know, and I talk publicly about this, my dad, you know, was a classic, a, a beautiful, fiercely loving narcissist. And he could be really tough and he was very pragmatic and um, very traditional in a lot of ways in terms of his spiritual beliefs. But he actually sat there, uh, it makes me want to cry, while I read him the chapter from your book about what happens when you die. You know, wow. when you died, like that, that chapter in Dying to Be Me where you describe the experience you had when you crossed over. And he sat there and intently listened as I read him the whole chapter. And this was after we had started hospice and he was just wrapping his head around the fact that he was terminal. And I knew he was really scared because wow. unlike all I've learned from you and you know, in my own studies, not that I want to die, you know, I'm not scared in the way so many people are. I don't have these really hell and damnation stories about what happens after you die, but I think he did. And I really think that was a huge part of the beginning of his release. Wow. Which I but, thank you for. Oh my God, thank you for sharing that. That really, really touches me. Um, oh, yeah. oh gosh, see, I, even I'm tearing up because <laughs> of that. And, and it's, it's so interesting because of the way you say that he was narcissistic and I think at one point you had said he's not really open to this sort of mm -mm, thing not at all I mean he he liked altered states don't get me wrong you know his whole life if you could offer him a pill or an herb or something that would send him into an altered state you know he would be into that but he didn't really you know he was he would he didn't really have a spiritual practice if he did it was as a very secular Jewish practice, you know, the high holidays. And while Jews don't believe in hell per se, there's a lot of judgment, you know, and there's a lot of guilt, as we all know. And his narcissistic edge would not let him feel the shame or the guilt. And so I think my sense being so intimately involved in his slow transition toward death, um, 
is that he was really he didn't have that kind of spiritual foundation or faith really you didn't as you write about you didn't either before you had this experience right i think a lot of people don't have that i didn't have that until i went through breast cancer se- you know, yeah. seven years ago it's it's those you know big tra- he never had that so so he didn't have an understanding he was scared you know if you if you were ashamed of some of the things you've done you're scared you're scared um, and so, actually, even though many of us think we have a spiritual foundation, yeah. it's based on fear. Yes. So, for example, I used to study, like I would read um, up about the Bhagavad Gita and a lot of different things. I, I thought I was very spiritual, yes. but so much of it was steeped in fear. It's like there are people yes. who are um, religious, but they could be steeped in the fear oh, yeah. of what happens I in think the afterlife. I think organized religion in general is, at least modern organized religion, is... Yes, the, a lot of it it's is all steeped based in fear. On fear. And so there is this fear of the afterlife. Yeah. And so, um, and and the thing is, for me, what the near-death experience did is it made me lose this fear of the afterlife, made me lose the fear of death, which you say for you happened when you went through cancer. Yes, and when I, you know, and at the time I read your book for the first time, and this was seven or eight years ago, and I really, it was because of that, you know, when we have what I call AFGEs, another freaking growth experience, you know, these big upheavals. It's like a, an opportunity. It's you know, I always say that the universe kind of taps at your door, and we usually don't listen. Then it knocks harder, still don't listen. Then it starts banging, yes. and eventually tears the house down. My house tear down was you know breast cancer. Um, after you know all within a year after my mom died, and so it was really. Uh, I had to have a mastectomy. I had to go through chemo. I lost oh. all my hair. You know, it was this big transition, and I had to literally stop my life. And when things like that happen, it doesn't have to be cancer. It can be a near-death experience. It can be a divorce. It can be losing your house. It can be any. You know, it can be just someone you love passing. You know, something that really shakes our foundation almost shakes us free yeah of the fear because the worst is kind of happening you know yes exactly because the worst is already happening and for me there was also a feeling when i was diagnosed it was like uh before being diagnosed i was living this life of fear yeah. and when i was diagnosed it was like okay now it's happened i can kind yeah. of relax it's like okay it's happened right i got i right. got the thing that I was most right. scared. I of. remember talking to you about that yeah. several a couple of years ago. We were having lunch, and I remember you said, "You know, if I if I admit it, there was a little part of me that felt relieved." Yes. When I got the diagnosis, and I was like, "Me too." I felt relieved. Yes, too. I remember that. We yeah. were sharing that because yeah. because that part of me said, "Now I can take care of myself." Yes. Yes. Now I can that do things for myself. That is one of the best lessons of cancer, for sure. Yeah. And so many things you've been saying have been a gift. I mean, even um, the cancer, which I totally yeah. agree with. But also there were certain things you were talking about um, in, in your upbringing. And, yeah, yeah. And you just felt it was a gift. Like yeah. A, well, that was one of the, uh, I mean, I was starting to tell you, but we, we'll talk about, I think it's, We'll save it for the cameras here, so that because I think it's a really important lesson for all of us, and it was a really profound experience for me because when when I had put my dad in hospice, he was still sort you know sort of compass mentis, and he you know I had read him your book, and we were talking about lots of things, and this is a guy who was extremely successful, like a lion of a man, um, never ever ever to my memory, ever once apologized for anything and could be very, um, you know, at least to me, emotionally abusive. Um, I don't think he would have ever called himself that, but, you know, he didn't, he could be very critical, very controlling. And, you know, people often ask me, especially since one of my key specialties as a therapist is sex therapy, and that's a lot of what I'm known about, you know, people will often say, well, how do you become someone who can talk about sex like the weather, you Mm. know, um, and can feel so comfortable with it. And part of it is because my family was very comfortable, but part of it was because my dad, I think, really saw part of his job as teaching me to be a seductress. 
like part of teaching me to be a woman was to teach me how to be a woman according to what a man, meaning him, yeah. would want. Wow. And so like, you know, when I, when I was 14, he gave me a Cosmo article on how to perform oral on a guy. Wow, at age 14. Yeah, and the irony was that he didn't want me to do it with anyone yet, but he wanted me to be an expert. And he would constantly oh comment on my body or tell me what looked good on me or what didn't. I mean, even as recent as a few years ago, I was visiting him and my husband was in Chicago and I was in Georgia with my dad and he knew my husband was arriving that m night and he's like, you know, I hope you're planning something special for him. Like he was trying to coach me around like sexually rewarding my husband upon his, because to him that was the care and feeding Oh of my God. a relationship. So what happened not long before he died, because a lot of what, you know, he had lots of infidelities. Uh, I don't think he'll mind wherever he is, me sharing this, um, but he had lots of infidelities. And there was a point in, when I was around 18, where I said, I was two, I was the parentified child. I was their therapist, you know, kept them together, which is no surprise, that's what I do now. But I, um, I remember saying to him, if you keep seeing this woman, you're gonna lose me. I will never speak to you again. And then I was flabbergasted and traumatized when he chose to keep seeing her. Oh. And so the conversation I had with him about a month before he died, I shared that with him. I was like, you know, you've often joked that it's because of you that I'm a sex therapist. And that's true in part, but not for the reasons you think. You know, and I, sh I share, I was like, I needed to understand why a father who loved me would choose sex over me. And the fact that that happened led me to believe that I wasn't worthy of love and put me on a trajectory of really bad decisions that hurt me a lot. And, and so both things are true, but the end result is look at where I am, look at all the thousands and millions of people I get to help learn to love and be loved better. Yeah. And all the gifts that that's allowed me to share and experience in my life. And all these decisions I made led to the birth of my son, of my oldest son, or led to me eventually meeting the, the, you know, the, the love of my life. And if it hadn't have been for all of those traumas and dramas that your actions visited on me, this wouldn't have happened. So I just want you to know that not only do I forgive you, I thank you. And it was, it, I said all of that for me. Like I really wanted to forgive him and have him know I forgave him before he went. But the last thing I imagined was that he, he first said, you know, it's a lot more complicated than that. And he was kind of looking down. I said, I know, I'm only talking about you know, because he also said, yeah. why would you, what did you find out about why someone would do that? And I said, well, you know, part of it is the obvious reason, but it's really about someone who doesn't feel their own worthiness of love yeah, and needs to find love and the approval of other women. You know, and I kind of spelled out his narcissistic character to him in a very loving way. He said, well, it's more complicated than that. I said, I know, I'm only saying what I can see. But then he said, you know, I am truly, truly, truly sorry. Oh, wow. I mean, this man, I have never heard him say he's sorry. And he sat there and told me he, he took it all in and I was very loving and he was very loving and it was one of the most profound moments of my life. Wow. Yeah. Do you know, I sense he's even supporting you right now in sharing this. I think he and, is. And using everything you've learned to help other people. Oh, he loved that. In yeah. fact, my mother, when she died, left me a secret safety deposit box. This was seven years ago that I didn't even know about until the bank sent me a notice that the box was, you know, that the money to support the box had run out and did I want to put deposit more? I'm like, what is this box? I go in go down to Georgia, I get the box. There are a few little trinkets in it, but mostly what's in it is all of these tapes. You know, this was back in the, in the early 90s. She had taped, you know, like where you could tap the phones, you yeah. could go to Radio Shack, and had taped him on the phone with his lovers <gasps> oh. to bust him. And she saved the tapes and left them to me which then left me with a whole summer like, what the hell do I do with this? Oh my God. You know, do I listen to them? 
Do I, like, what do I do? And so I mentioned it to my father. And I was like, you know, mom left me these tapes. What do you think I should do? I was just really curious. He's like, well, and this was so my dad, which is why I think you're right about him thinking, yeah, use me. Because he said, well, you know, it does, it will, it could be very useful in explaining the power of sexual attraction. Like he was thinking you could use it as like material for your work in the world. He loved when I used him as part and he was he was like yes use my infidelity and i was like god you're a narcissist you know like Ugh. that's that's very narcissistic oh, no. to love attention whether it's yes. negative or positive yes. so i took it out to the beach and i set a big fire and i burned them without listening to them and i released it all that was what i did with those tapes but wow how how did your mother handle his infidelity did she I'm, I'm guessing that's part of the reason yeah. why she passed so early. Oh, yeah. She had many, many cancers. Oh, God. See, it doesn't she, surprise me No, at all. and she was very unempowered. And he, you know, she grew up in an abusive, emotionally abusive, and sometimes physically abusive household. She married him, like, right when she graduated from college. And he was like the classic narcissist. He didn't want her to have friends. He was very controlling of her. He, he made all the money. He didn't want her to work, you know, and oh, she was man. brilliant and uh, never worked and um, was very controlled by him really until probably the last five years of her life. But, um, and we had a lot of conversations about that as she was dying and what my reaction was, you know, cause we all sort of, I talk about this all the time in my radio show, we learn how to love not through what's told to us, but what we see modeled. Yes. You know? And so what I, I mean, this is really what led to quantum love is because what I decided very early is like, okay, these are my two choices. I can be like her or I can be like him. Well, I'm not going to be like her. Yeah. So I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be in my power by being, I mean, I didn't notice it at the time or would have called it this, but basically by being in my masculine. Yeah. You know, I by see. trying to fix, manage, and control everything. Yes. Which doesn't work. <laughs> there is so much in what you've said to unpack. And by the way, for those who are viewing, listening, um, please, please send in questions. Yeah. If you have any questions to do with life, death, relationships, love, sex, anything at all, just type it in. And yeah. Danny, who's behind the scenes, he's going to read through the questions and he's going to pick some of the strong, the, the powerful ones and ask it to us to answer for the audience. Yeah. But there is so much. So one of the things that comes to mind is we always teach what we most need to uh -huh. learn. And so the thing that I had always struggled with was basically self-love. I always lived a life of fear, fear of cancer. And of course, what happened? I got cancer. Um, in, in your case, um, you've ended up teaching about sex and relationships because that's where that's where the dysfunction was. The dysfunction and was, And what yeah. ended up happening is as a result, I got involved with a man when I was young who was a serial cheater. And I remember literally thinking, and I, if, you're, if anyone is thinking this, it is incorrect, but I literally thought, well, everyone, like, because my dad and my mom had both reinforced this, all men cheat. That's just oh, what men geez. do. So it's better to be with the devil you know than the devil you don't know. So I was, I stayed with this guy and you know had a baby with him and then found out he was having an affair our entire relationship Ooh, that's and um but the funny thing is with him you know once again being in my masculine i was like i was you know he did whatever i wanted he you know i was sort of in control and if i was the boss of the relationship then that meant in my mind that i was in power right yeah. and if i was in power and he needed me because he depended on me emotionally or logistically, then he would never leave me, right? Yeah. Well, you know, that's just not true. And my young little sweet self unfortunately learned that lesson, but it was a very powerful lesson because I, like many of what, I, you know, it's usually women who, who I call alpha women. You know, we, we think a modern empowered woman, you know, is sort of the boss. Yeah, one of us needs to be the boss. So I'm going to be the boss and he's going to I'm going to dress, you know, choose what he wears and where we go on vacation. And, you know, and if I do all of that, then I'll be safe. Right. And it was such an epiphany to me to go through that AFGE because I realized, well, that's not going to keep you safe. No. You know, yeah. and it also allowed me to break down enough to where after four years, I eventually met my husband of 17 years, who I call my final husband. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know. I'm so glad that you're you're in this relationship with your husband, and uh, and you've been together 17 years, yep. and you've got a two more kids, yeah. and two dogs, and yeah. many other animals along See, the way. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Now, having been through everything you've been through, and you've been through a lot, and mm -hmm. you've even been through the cancer, which I am sure is less to do with your current husband and your relationship but more to do with, with the all past. the trauma oh, of yeah. the past yes. and, and, and a little bit with him because I wasn't in my power I was in that constant because he's a very masculine yes energy but even the way you are with him is to do with the beliefs that you've accumulated yes. from all those years yes. with your parents so if um, so let's jump into what you do today, because you help so many people today. You know, I've been on your radio show yeah. a couple of times, yeah. and you're out there, and you're speaking, and you're teaching, and you're writing. So um, I would love for you to share some tips. If, let's start with, let's say somebody is mm -hmm. going through a relationship where they feel their partner is, um, is not faithful to, to yeah. them. How would they deal with learning about infidelity? Do you think they should confront it? Do you think that, uh, at what point do you think that, uh, let's target this at, at women for the sake of this mm -hmm. particular conversation. I know it can happen to both sides, but at what point do you think a woman should feel that no, um, this is not salvageable or right. at what point should Throw she, in the towel. Yeah, throw in the towel. Um, okay. So what, first of all, you know, cheat on me once, shame on you, cheat on me twice, and I'm still staying, shame on me, yeah. right? So let's just assume that this is a one-off thing, right? And this person has cheated. And of course it depends, was it a one-night stand or was it a three-year affair? You know, that's gonna create different issues in yeah. the recovery. But the bottom line is that unequivocally, I, I've been doing this for over 25 years and I work a lot with couples and in infidelity. And I can tell you it is not only absolutely possible to repair your relationship after an affair, but the cool part is if you get the help you need and you both really go in with an open heart and open mind and are willing to do the work, not only will you heal, but the irony, which maybe isn't that ironic in our minds, is that you will end up with a better relationship than you ever would have had if the infidelity hadn't happened because of all the work you've done together. And I have seen that happen time and time again. Now, where you throw in the towel is you don't take that person back if they're not willing to do that and invest in really intensive individual and couples therapy because they have to be able to understand and articulate what led them internally to make the decisions they did, which of course have some to do with their partner, but mostly to do with things that have nothing to do with their partner. Yeah. And they have to be dealing and working with that. And the two of you have to be in couples therapy to be working on rebuilding trust and rebuilding connection and clearing things out. And where I see couples struggle is when they don't get the help that they need or one of them isn't willing. So if you're, the cheater is not willing to cut off the affair and all contact with the affair, is not willing to go to treatment yeah. and really stay invested in treatment, then you throw the towel in. Yeah, and also, I would add there, if the cheater makes the other person like it was their fault, oh, yes. or blames them, yes. then you throw in the towel. No, yeah. you throw in the towel. You can't do that. No, no. and they often will. And, and the one thing I will say is that, and I've real, I realized this many, many years ago, even about my mom, who was like a saint in my mind, that even, it doesn't make it okay that that person cheated on you, yeah. but there were dynamic, it's a dance that you're doing together, right? So even if you were the victim of the cheating, what you wanna do is like, I'm this innocent martyr who you have to take all the blame and it is their fault. But you were part of the dance too. Yeah. And they, you have to be willing to They have to be that. willing to not tolerate that yeah. in the relationship. Yes. They have to be willing to and stand voice up and their say, needs. this is not okay. Right. Like it's not okay. Um, I'm, yeah. And that's the thing. And. Uh, and I agree with that because um, I know that I'm the kind of person that for me in a relationship, it's not okay. It's a non-starter. Yeah. And I think a lot of couples make the mistake, especially with social media, of not really having a clear discussion. Yeah. You know, I remember that even coming up with my parents, my mother saying, well, we've been in therapy. And like he said, he didn't know. Like, I was like, what? But 
But it's true that people make, you have to articulate it, you know, and with social media, which is, you know, Facebook is being cited in one in five divorces now because it's like oh. a, it's like a high school and college reunion on steroids, right? Yeah. You get in a fight with each other and then one of you is on, goes back and sees their ex-boyfriend or girlfriend from high school or college. How are you? How, you know, how are the kids? What's happening? How's your marriage? Well, it's not, you know, and you start investing energy over there yeah. rather than in repairing your relationship. And so, you know, really discussing, are we gonna be friends with our exes on social media or not? Do we have each other's passwords? Not because we're gonna be constantly checking on each other, but because there's nothing to hide, you know? Yes. What's okay, like my general rule of thumb, if when people ask me what the line should be, is that in social media and in all cases, you should not be speaking, behaving, acting in any way that you wouldn't do with your partner standing right next to you. And if you use that as your litmus, you're golden. I like that. That's a really good litmus test. Yeah. Yeah. And if you feel the need to shut down your screen when your partner comes yeah. in the room, then that's a warning. Then yeah. that's like or you, you take the, the phone, you're always putting it down and yeah. you have like 20 voice face password recognitions that your partner doesn't know. Yeah. Those are bad that's, signs. Or if your partner does that, yes. and then that's a bad sign. Yeah, I mean, that's a warning sign. New underwear all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> suddenly taking a big, you know, a real interest in their appearance and their physique in a way they weren't before. Unaccounted periods of time. Yeah, unaccounted periods of time. That's, yeah. Wow, those are interesting. So now here's um, another just a, a, a question that I know comes up for me, people writing in to me and people I, I come across in my audience. Um, dating, again, especially now in today's mm -hmm. arena with social media, with dating apps, um, there are a lot of people, a lot of women I know who are maybe divorced, who are maybe in their 40s, getting 50s, there. getting back out there, 50s, 60s, could be anything, getting back out there. It's hard, it's yeah. not easy. And it's a whole new landscape, it's especially with online dating, if you're gonna do that. Um, and you know, that's a whole strategy in and of itself that can be tricky. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, everything from like, what's this Brazilian? Am I supposed to get one of those wax, yeah. you know, to, I hear about that. <laughs> to, you know, safer sex, to all of the things. And it, it's not easy, but this is where, you know, quantum love comes in as well. What I try to help people understand in all things that you want to manifest, but especially in love, what you want to focus on is not so much, you know, the characteristics and qualities you want that partner you're going to find to have a certain height, a certain job, even a certain personality, like, okay, maybe four or five things that are really important to you, no more. What you really want to focus on is that if that person, whoever that person's going to be, were here with me and I was waking up with them every day and we were in relationship, how would I feel? How would I feel? And get really, really, you know, would you feel playful? Would you feel lustful? Would you feel adventurous? Would you feel safe? Would you feel cherished? Like, if you had the most perfect partner, how would you feel in relationship with that partner? And then you wanna stay in those feelings as much as possible, right? Yeah. So, sorry, my mic keeps falling down. <laughs> um, so what that means is if, you know, maybe, Playful is one of your things, right? And you don't have a partner to be playful with, but you walk by a playground every day where you could go and swing on the swings or jump on a trampoline or like, you start looking for ways to be playful that have nothing to do with love, but that create the energetic frequency of playfulness. And then what starts to happen is not only are you getting a lot of the feelings you want, but you start attracting in like a magnet, all sorts of people and experiences some of them potential partners who also are playful, right? I like that. That's one of the ways that quantum love, you know, because quantum love is all about ha applying the principles of quantum physics to your love life. Yeah. And what, you know, and you know this as well as I, all the cool stuff in quantum physics and, and the metaphysical world right now coming together, but how it's really the energy that you hold in your body, you know, we're made of energy. And it's, we're in training to each other. Even yes. Danny, who's crawling around, are you trying to fix my m microphone? <laughs> and 
Danny, I wish Danny's I could turn the camera fours. down. He's yeah. down on all fours. He's, yeah, he's on all fours right now, and he's adjusting Laura's camera. And I think if you come up just high peek enough, peek your head up, your Danny. Head will be, go on, just just peek it up. Just peek there, 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 there. a little bit higher, a little higher, no, a little bit, a little bit to this side. No, wrong. Side. Anyway, he's crawling all over the floor, but. A little no. bit higher. Higher, Danny, higher. Um, Put your head up a little bit more. <laughs> he's such a good sport. He's, he's literally crawling around. Wait. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Anyway. Now he's goofing around trying to distract us. Okay, when you were describing all those traits, I was thinking playful, Daddy is right? definitely That's playful. Danny. <laughs> But I love Ooh. what you said. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely playful, and that's something I know that I definitely wish wanted. wanted. <laughs> and I was, I was playful you when are I met playful. him. I am playful. Yes. And people t tell me, my friends actually tell me that that um, when people first meet me, they don't realize it, but it's like yeah. kind of underneath this yeah. that I'm extremely mischievous. Yeah, <laughs> you come off as shy, but yeah. you're really not. No, I'm, I know. <laughs> but, but what I loved about what you said is that even when I speak about healing, I say the same thing and you've applied it to love, which yes. I love because I tell people that if you're going through an illness, if you're going through cancer or whatever it is, don't focus on the illness. Focus on the life you would mm -hmm. live if you were well. Yes. The illness was a wake up call. So you don't want to live the life that got you the illness. You now want to create the life that you want to live after you get that clean bill yes. of health. Same so start thing. living it now so that you're in that energy and in that energy you bring in the health. And that is the secret behind the secret. You know, when you hear the people, I'm going to write myself a check for a million dollars and then it will show up in the bank. And then it doesn't and you think, oh, this doesn't work. But what's missing is the feeling. Because what yes. happens in the quantum field is our body is like a radio antenna. And we are emitting energy all the time and that our body's frequency is constantly shifting and changing and matching everyone in the room. And if you hold, and this was something that I really learned as a recovering codependent, um, because I would just match, I needed everyone else to be okay to feel okay. Yes. In my lovely upbringing. Um, so to learn to hold my own frequency my own energetic state, which is set by our emotions once we become conscious of that. It's something we do naturally. We're just not conscious about it. Okay. When we can hold that for ourselves, everyone else in the room matches us. Yes. And those of us who are codependent going around, okay, I'm matching, you know, we don't even realize it. We're just matching everyone and everything else. That's exactly what happens. And sometimes that gets forgotten. Yes. When we talk about the law of attraction and yes. the secret, we forget that we are energy beings it's not just about writing that no. check and it's not just about saying even not just about even saying the affirmations it's about energetically feeling it feeling, feeling it as it, if it's living it, real as if it's real as if it's happening right here right now yes so if you're going through an illness live your life as a healthy person what yes. would your life look like if you were healthy you wouldn't be focusing on health yeah. you would be living life yes as if you were healthy as if you were healthy. and sometimes if you have a really intense illness or you're physically unable to live the life that you would live if you were healthy this is the really cool part is that the brain and the body do not know the difference between reality and rehearsal. Yes. So if you just imagine doing those things, let's say you're physically incapable of it right now, you, if you imagine that it were happening, you were in that scene, you're not seeing yourself in the scene, but you were literally in it yes. as if it's happening right here, right now, then that literally moves your body into the frequency of that experience. And then that emits out to the quantum field, and that's what the law of attraction is. That's what makes us a magnet for what we're wanting to manifest. Yes. So that's really the key that I think is missing in a lot of the talk about the secret. Yeah, it is. Uh, that is missing. And the other thing is that um, when we are manifesting the feeling, mm -hmm. um, it isn't about 
manifesting a million dollars. No. It's about manifesting enough abundance to keep you in that feeling. Right. Or what would it feel like? So imagine you have the million dollar check in your hand or in the bank, you know, getting really clear on what you're seeking, right? Because for me, having financial abundance is the feeling of freedom. Yeah, that's what it is for That's me. what it is for me. And so when I hold the frequency of freedom with those intentions, then yeah, it'll come in as money, it'll come in as opportunities, it'll come in as gifts, it'll come in from all sorts of places I couldn't even think of, Yeah. right? But I'm now a beacon for freedom. Yeah, it is, and it's totally freedom, and it's freedom to do what we feel we're put on this planet yes. to do. Because I know that when, as I make more money, all I do with it is invest more right, in doing right. more of what Me I too. do. That's all Me I do. Too. You know, you just want to manifest bigger events, bigger audiences, more videotaping, yes. more, more just more technology, content, more, more technology, yeah. more content, get, get your message out wider. Right. And broader. you know, and the more abundance comes in, the less you have to worry about going out and making the bacon and you can express your gifts in the world. Yeah. Right? And then the feeling, is. cause you and I both know this feeling of when you get to express your gift in the world and it actually helps other people. Like there's for me and I know for you too, there is nothing yummier. Yeah, there is nothing yummier. So when I'm in that feeling, that just keeps creating more yeah. amazing opportunities like this conversation. Which is so important because uh, just going back again to love, but we can say love, abundance, uh, it applies to all of Health, it. Health, yeah. Health, all of it applies to this. So when you're desperately seeking a partner, mm -hmm. the energy you're in is that desperately scarcity. seeking energy, the yeah. scarcity. Uh, and it's the same when you are desperately trying to make more money because you're afraid that you don't have enough. Usually when people pursue money, it comes from a fear of not having enough. And that's the energy that is being matched that's by the world. the hardest world. thing about manifesting. Yeah, you because know? you're in the energy yes. of the fear of lack, whether it's the lack of relationship, lack of money, and that is the energy that's being right. matched by the universe. And by everyone around you is yeah. reinforcing that too in our yeah. society. So what I like to say is that if you can just hold the frequency of that which you desire, 51% of the time, yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to do it 100% of the time if, you know, none of us are really, but if you can do it 51% of the time to start, your entire situation will change for the better, it you would. know, and you, and it's a practice in my mind. And I teach this in quantum love, you know, it's, I now can put my body into what I call home frequency, which is sort of the quantum love zone of anything from like hopefulness and optimism to joyful, playful, expansive, loving, blissful, you know, all the way up the scale. Like if I, you know, at first it was hard because I was someone who lived so much in scarcity and fear, yeah. you know, back then. And so I would teach myself, I would like move myself in my mind in that, you know, kind of meditation to that abundant place. And then I'd start and I'd notice what it felt like in my body. And then I'd start thinking very easily about something that stressed me out and I'd notice what that constriction felt like in my body. And I would move back and forth between the two, almost like this little biofeedback to the point where I got really comfortable and now it's second nature, unless I'm triggered, but it's second nature that when I walk around in the world, I'm in home frequency, yeah. right? Because I, I just, and I know, like, if, or if I'm going into an important meeting, I can move myself into the physical state Ooh, nice. of that frequency, which yeah. is really cool. See, that's nice to be able to do it before going into an important yes. meeting. Yeah, I love that. Let's check in to see if we have any good questions. I'm sure we have tons. We haven't even looked. Now that Danny's not crawling around that floor anymore, are there? Oh, yes. here's one. Oh, oh we did here that. we go. Did we do that? How do you know when your husband is not faithful? Well, okay, how do we know? Well, I mean, I'll, at some point, you gotta do some sleuthing, right? But we talked about the signs. We did. So they'll, they're, they'll usually get a lot meaner because they're feeling guilty, so they're critical. They're finding things wrong with you that justify what they're doing in ah. their own minds. They, I'm not kidding about the new underwear and lingerie. They will get new, often new underwear or suddenly yeah. take an interest in new clothes or change their fashion a little bit, new interest in their body. And, you know, that wasn't that, that sort of all of a sudden um, they're very private and secretive about their passwords, their phone, their technology. They're disappearing for periods of time and you can't reach them. And 
your gut is telling you something isn't right. And yeah. you know, those of us who are used to narcissists or don't feel worthy of love or have been cheated on or had to, you know, not really trust ourselves early on, aren't used to listening to our gut. Yeah. You know, and so trust your gut. Trust That's, it and do trust. some sleuthing. Once if all those clues are there, it's okay to snoop. And and you know, don't be afraid to ask a few questions yeah. and just see his But they reaction. will deny. They yeah. deny, 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 and then deny some more. Oh gosh. I and I think one of the worst things is when they when they try and blame yeah. the, the person who they're actually cheating yes. on and yes. make it their fault. That's it's, like extra abusive. Yes, it is. Any more questions? I'm looking at Boo. Ah, okay. Here's one from Janina Segura Bartholomew. Can you talk more about freedom? My husband has gone through layoffs and has gone back to school to teach in high school, but hasn't been able to find employment, which has created depression and mm -hmm. anxiety. Yeah. Okay, so I'm guessing the depression and anxiety is kind of keeping her in that energy of attracting more right. of or the her, same. Or her husband, I guess. She was and saying her husband. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think for men especially, their self-worth and confidence in our society, unfortunately, is so tied to their work, yes. what they do. And so when they aren't be being successful in their work and what they do, they get depressed and shut down. Like if you, you know, it's interesting, like even looking at male desire, sexual desire versus female, you know, a woman will lose her sexual desire if she's stressed about just about anything chronically stressed yeah. a man won't it, unless it's financial or work-related stress because that hits him in the center of his worth and his mm. sense of manhood so if he's not feeling success he's gonna feel depressed and anxious very often and so your role I think is two part one you want to support him in getting help I mean not just saying this because I'm a therapist and a fan of therapy but you know, this is the kind of thing that sometimes personal empowerment and reading books is enough, but very often you need the help of a good therapist because these feelings of depression and worthlessness that he's probably feeling are very old feelings yes. that now are just being stirred up through this experience. And so a therapist will be, who's, you can help him with that, will not only help him work through what's happening now, but release it from happening again and again, right? Yeah. And the second thing, is that if you can hold the space, the frequency of optimism and abundance, right? And what we do often as partners is it's hard to do that in the presence of our loved one being depressed because we're em em empathetic, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying be skipping around the house while he's sitting in the corner crying, but if you can say like, I know, if you can really truly hold that, he will feel it when you say, I know you're gonna find something. I know that if you stick with it and stay optimistic, you're following your passion and I believe in you, even if you don't believe in yourself right now. So you don't join him in that hopeless frequency. You lovingly and gently hold the frequency for him. I love that. See, that's beautiful. And uh, again, it's very, very parallel to what I talk about in healing, mm -hmm. is that if you are a healer, your job is to see the person you're healing as already whole, yes. as already healed, so that you hold that frequency. Yes, and for that's them. what you're doing as his wife. Yeah, you have to hold that frequency. Yeah, that's really great because it it like works yes. across yes. all issues. Yes. Yeah, I like that. So um, there was actually. Actually, let's go in another question because I had been thinking of something I wanted to ask you myself to do with gender disparity, actually. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll go into that first and then we'll go to another question. Um, I wanted to ask you about, like, say, for example, with men. So this isn't exactly disparity, but say with men, uh -huh. you're saying that um, they're, in a sense, their worthiness is dependent on their their work or how much money they bring in 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 the case of many men yeah and so if they're not earning money if they're not doing well um in holding down work or bringing in an income then their self-worth is kind of taking a beating so what would be the equivalent in a in a woman what is um, her worthiness pretty much on? everything else <laughs> <laughs> we're much more 
<laughs> what, you know, for women, yes, there's like for us, unfortunately, and you know, I'm talking about societal influences more than anything else. Like men, I think it's pretty much primarily because of the way they were raised. And I see this a lot more in men over 35 than under 35 who have been taught to be in touch with their emotions and be valued for many things and, and that women work too and they don't have to be the main provider. But for the over 35ers, we'll see a lot more of that. For women, I would guess if I had to you know, put them in a hierarchy, body image mm -hmm. is a huge place of worthlessness. Um, feeling having a partner yep you know finding a partner having a partner yes you know a huge part like if you asked a bunch of single guys you know has your difficulty finding love impacted your feelings about yourself they would probably most of them say no i'd like to find love but you know i feel good. if you ask a bunch of women they are going to internalize it i mean we basically internalize everything is being yeah. our fault yeah and because we somehow are lame or suck or ugly or whatever it is that we think we are you yeah. know and then if you have that story about yourself you are going to find evidence for it everywhere you look yep you know yep so it is it's everything it's body image it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah it's it's all of it I... it's part of our beauty and our curse you know because we it's the same thing we can multitask in a way that men can't which is a blessing because we can talk on the phone for work, help a kid with homework, make dinner all at the same time. Yeah. You know, but it's a curse when it comes to things we're worried about, when it comes to sex, because if we're not feeling good about ourselves or a partner or worrying about the fight we got in with our boss that day or how the kids are going to get to soccer practice or whatever it is that's going on, it's hard to kind of focus. Yeah. Men, because they're so yeah. focused, their curse is that you can't talk to them while they're driving or they can only do one thing at a time, but it works to their advantage when it, you know, cause they can feel not great about a lot of things, but they can compartmentalize more easily. Yeah, that's true. Most of the men I've seen do that. Yeah. They compartmentalize. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's so fascinating. I mean, it's a topic I could talk to you about forever. Me and, too. Yeah. And although we are generalizing, not everybody falls into no, those boxes, of not. but yeah. And also, um, I think, Men who are super sensitive, they get judged a lot yes. for being super sensitive. Yes. They're empaths. Yes. Empath men struggle. They do, even more than women, um, because they're supposed to. Once again, I see a shift in the under 35ers yeah. where there's a lot more permission. But, you know, certainly I call the men of my generation or of our generation, you know, the men who were nursed through burning bras, right? Yeah. So they were taught, don't ever do anything, you know, don't ever do to a woman what society has done to your mother and, you know, like be a good man. But there's this confusion about what a good man is because, you know, you're supposed to be what I call a snag, a sensitive new age guy, you know? But at the same time, you got to beat anyone up who threatens her. You got to be tough. You got to like have all these signs of traditional masculinity. And yet you also have to give her the like, how do they walk that line? It's so freaking confusing. That's really tough. It's I know. Really and I know tough. men like that because that would, that's the men of our generation, yes. as you say. Yeah, I know a lot of men who, who have a tough time walking that line. It's really challenging. Really tough. Yeah. And, and the women have a hard time, too, because they, like I was saying, they're, you know, what I see happen time and time again is all the young, you know, they're dating a guy and all the girls are, you know, friends are high-fiving her kind of because he does whatever she says, you know? Yeah. And she's like, honey, go get the blah, 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 you know? <laughs> and she picks out all this clothes and where they're going to go on vacation and she's like all... And, and it's all fine in the beginning and he's like doing and everyone's like you know all she's all proud of herself because she's this empowered woman in the relationship and then eventually she starts getting really grossed out with the monster she's created especially when they when she has an actual child yeah. and she now and then that's when she'll start saying he needs to step up like that's oh. you know he needs to step up but when he goes and loads the dishwasher she harumphs and comes over and reloads it you know huh. and so eventually he starts feeling like she's a, a nagging mother and she starts feeling like he's an errant child and you can imagine what happens to their sex life. Oh God. And so it's really a dance that I see men and women doing together. Yeah, wow. There's, there's so much there. I mean, and I want people to be able to 
find you, anybody who's listening yeah. in, and if they want to contact you and find you or do workshops with yeah, you. Yeah, I have like a workshop coming up next weekend, uh, the September 13th through 15th at 1440 Multiversity. If Ooh. you can join me there, I'm doing a quantum love weekend. So whether you're single or in a relationship looking for love or wanting to build better love, um, it's quantum love. You can come by yourself or with a partner, or with a friend. And I also, you can now get my radio show, Uncovered Radio, um, on, on uh, Spotify. Oh, that's um, nice. I highly recommend the radio show. I've been on your yeah, radio show. Yeah, you can a listen to times. my interviews with Anita. They're on there. Yeah, and I would highly recommend you going to the workshop. I mean, I would if I could, but it's, but I mean, just for the fun of it, yes. to see you. Because yes. uh, you're such a good speaker oh, and well, you're really you, good at what I you I feel do. the same way about you. We have a mutual fan club here. We do. <laughs> we really do. Do we have any more questions? I'm sure we got tons of questions. Oh, there's one. Two more questions. Let's take two more. Lee Michael, any words for those struggling with PTSD or other related mm. themes stemming from sexual abuse? Oh. oh, yeah, I am so passionate about that. Um, and it's so huge, and especially now with all the things happening and Me Too and the Epstein thing, there's so many memories coming to the surface yeah. and repressed memories coming to the surface. And PTSD is huge and um, plays a huge role in our ability to stay in the frequencies of that which we want to create because you're being triggered to fear and scarcity and, and until you really resolve that, um, you know, it, it kind of keeps you stuck, you know, yeah. and I am an abuse survivor myself, so I understand that. And um, what I have found is that, you know, you certainly want to do this kind of spiritual expansive work but the best form of therapy that I have found uh, for specifically for PTSD, if I had to name one, is somatic experiencing. And if you can look up online, you know, even if you go to the somatic experiencing organization and look for practitioners trained, that is a very, very powerful form of therapy as is EMDR and other things, but you have to heal that. And more often than not, let's say, you know, you've, been through a horrific relationship that was abusive more often than not the abuse started way before that relationship it started in childhood ah. and there that's been the pattern you yeah. know that's been set and part of the healing and it and i'm very sensitive about even bringing this up to people but i'm going to bring it up here um part of the healing is what i was talking about earlier with my dad not now when you're just starting treatment but eventually the ultimate healing comes when you can not only release the hold that the trauma created in you and the pain, but you can see the gifts in it. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that means you signed up for it or that it's good that it happened, but I do think on a soul level, we do sign up for these things because each of these traumas and dramas in our lives and losses and cancers and illnesses are here to teach us huge lessons that are part of us cultivating the gifts we're gonna share with the world. Yeah. And I have found that almost every victim of sexual abuse or trauma who heals becomes a healer. And the theme in my life, which I think is why I end up having all these things happen to me, is heal, learn, teach, right? Yeah. And maybe for someone else it's heal, learn, write, heal, learn, do, heal, learn, make, you know, whatever it is, heal, learn, and then it becomes part of your gift. Yeah, I, I'm actually I find that mine is exactly the same. That everything that I heal, I learn, I then teach. Yes. I seem to be sharing everything as yes, I'm learning it. Me too. Yeah. That's beautiful. That was beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you. And one final question we'll go to. And this one's from Manon Pelletier. Manon. Qu Manon. Question from Canada. What can a couple do to communicate better after one has been ill and has priority values change? Mm -hmm. Which they will do. That's part of what illness is for, right? Yeah. It shakes you up. It turns you inside out. I am a complete, I call myself pre-cancer is my 2D self and post-cancer is my 3D self. 
Yes, 2D and 3D. Or it could even be 3D and 4D. Yes. Let's take it up, okay. up a notch. I was 3D and 4D now. Yeah. Sorry. I'm kicking that, you. That's how I feel. I was yeah. 3D before. I'm 4D now. So. And I had to it. say to my husband, God bless him, at a certain point, I said, look, until this happened, I was someone who was codependent, needed to please everyone, wasn't okay if any, everyone else wasn't okay, would let everyone control me. Yep. And that is who you married. God bless you. Yeah. But that's not going to be the case anymore. And I think you're going to like it. <laughs> was, and he's like, what do you mean? I don't know if I'm going to like it. And I can't say that he liked it at first because he was like, why are you being such a bitch? And I had to learn how to... <laughs> really be in my power without being in my masculine, which is where quantum love comes in. It's the ultimate divine feminine. Men have it too, but for women, it's our ultimate power. Yeah. And it's like a Jedi mind trick for your relationship. And you can do therapy. I can do therapy with one person now using quantum love. But what ends up happening is that as you really self-actualize and realize your truth and your potential and live in that truth, one of two things happen. Either your partner naturally, maybe with some bumps along the way, rises to your new frequency, or it gets to the point where they can't, and it's literally a no-brainer to part ways. Yes. Like one or the other happens, and it's not something to be scared of because you are in your full truth. Yeah. And you can feel that, and it's empowering, and it's safe, and it's beautiful, and if and when that happens, you will be ready for it, right? But the pain of the situation has to be worse than the fear of getting out of it. Yeah, I totally get that. And that is really, really well answered because it's exactly that. When your priorities change, when you change, when you change because of an illness, you become more empowered, then you do, you become stronger. And, and you do have to give your partner the opportunity yes. to rise up. Because here's a mistake that a lot of people make. We become afraid to lose our partner and then we lower our own, right. um, yes, our own frequency. We make ourselves small. Make ourselves just to hold on yes. to the partner. You're not only doing yourself a disservice, but you're doing your partner a disservice yes. because you are undermining their capacity to rise right. up to what right. you have become. Ah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Amen. Ditto. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. So, so um, I think that we should. Uh, this comes. This brings us to the end of our of our hour. We were talking together for a whole hour. Really? It yeah. Flew. The time just flew by. Oh and my Danny gosh. didn't even stop us. Thank you, Danny. I know he didn't even <laughs> stop us. He didn't even share his voice. So yeah. It's like you know, he has that voice in the background that speaks, and people love his voice. His he radio has a good voice. radio voice. Yeah. You, you <laughs> he's, looking speak, he's looking at us with a funny yeah. look. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what it is you want me to say. I mean, Nothing. I, just we were commenting you on your are. beautiful voice. I'll be quiet and switch off my mic. No, you don't have to do <laughs> yeah. that. So I appreciate everybody for tuning yes, in. Yes, thank you. And we're going to put some links under this. We can post some of the links of yeah. where you want people yeah, to yeah, find yeah, out I will. more. Um, and thank you so much. And if you want more, so if you want more of Laura, we're going to post links underneath. If you want more from me, you know where to go. You, you know my Facebook, my website. Um, please join me at some of my events. And one of these days, Laura and I are going to do an event together. Yay. We are. Yes. We're planning we're, that. We're planning to do an event together, and we will keep you informed when we do that. So thank you all so much for tuning in, um, and I'll see you all really soon. I'll be back <laughs> soon. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also, I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.